most people, the Merseybeat scene of the early 60s is synonymous with the band that changed the face of pop music, the Beatles. But in the mid-60s, band after band coming out of Liverpool dominated the charts in an unprecedented way. For a while, it looked as if the hits would never stop, but it was all over in a few short years. Tastes changed. The Beatles moved on, leaving behind them the bands that had pioneered the first truly authentic British contribution to pop history. This is the story of those bands and that incredible time. This land's the place I love Little children, you better tell what you see Now I would feed off that pool in the port of Liverpool why there was this explosion of music in Liverpool at this particular time, no one really has a definitive answer. Perhaps its status as a port, absorbing people, goods and influences from all over the world, had something to do with it. What is known is that by the end of the 50s, teenagers all over the city, inspired by listening to American R&B and British skiffle, were desperate to play music. The first step was usually to get a guitar, but affordable guitars were hard to come by in the city. So I think I sent one for one out to Daily Mirror. I think John Lennon sent for the same one. They were made like orange boxes. I think they were made in Spain with six strings. They were virtually untunable. No scratch plate, because I remember getting a sheet of plastic to cut a white plastic scratch plate out and screw it on. I was playing guitar at a very young age, you know, just the acoustic guitar and, like, learning all these pop songs. I used to sit on the, on the top of the stairs in the house because it was all echoey and I thought it sounded great. The easy things that you could play, I found at that time, were the skiffle things. If you had a guitar and you knew three chords, you could play almost anything. I had the old beat-up acoustic thing. I used to stand on the corner in my hometown of Brutal, playing Lonnie Donovan songs, Rock Island Line and things like that. Down the Rock Island Line, she's the mighty good road. The Rock Island Line is the road to ride, yeah. The Rock Island Line, she's the mighty good road. Skiffle was like an American country western blues. I mean, listen to these songs like Rock Island Line. I thought, that's fabulous. If you can imagine a tea chest bass with a, with a piece of string and somebody trying to make it, uh, notes out of it, well, it was with a pinch of salt and tongue in the cheek, but people loved it because they were going out and, and, and they were dancing to it as well. Once past the stage of mastering an instrument, even a washboard, came the difficult part of getting into a group. Ralph Ellis was approached to join an established trad jazz and skiffle band, the Blue Jeans. And we stopped and we talked and he said, we're looking for another guitar player, singer. Would you be interested in joining the Blue Jeans? Well, it took me about the third of a second to think about it and said, I'd love to. And that was probably one of the biggest thrills of my life when I actually joined the Blue Jeans and then I went and bought the martini shirt and the light blue jeans. Uh, and I thought I was real cat's whiskers when I wore those. The Blue Jeans were early leaders on the Merseybeat scene, but they played trad jazz. For kids a little younger, it was American R&B that inspired them. I actually got the first record player in our house through a kind of rich aunt who had a, a sweet shop on a corner. But previous to that, I'd already been out and bought at least uh, seven or eight records, which I could not play at all. I used to sit there reading labels. <laughs> you know, night after night, just, you know, completely engrossed in the names, Little Richard and his band and all his other little names underneath. Shag go down by the Union Hall when the dogs start jumping, I have a ball of motor rocking. I was at the fairground with a couple of mates and uh, I still remember it to this day, it was ripped up by Little Richard and it was like a smack in the mouth. It was like, you know, as soon as it starts, oh, I have that. <laughs> on the way back from school, I went to David's house and he put on this record by a man called Elvis Presley, which was Heartbreak Hotel and Hound Dog. I went, oh, what is that? When I heard Heartbreak Hotel, when I heard the guitar sounds, I thought, how can we get these sounds? And I seen this guitar in the window. It was the most oddest looking guitar that I'd ever seen. It was an inch thick and it was like a plank of wood. 
but I liked it for the shape. It was an Antoria. But of course, I failed to realise with it not being a cello type guitar, you needed an amplifier to go with it. Well, the amplifiers again in 1958 were thin on the ground. So we made this amplifier up. It's like it had two valves in. It was in a cabinet 18 inch square. And I put a bolt of lightning across the front to make it look quite nice. This interest in rock and roll led to a rash of bands being formed. Bobby Thompson got together with Stockport Butcher's boy Ted Taylor to form the James Boys. Ted emerged as the front man and acquired a new name. He was a huge kid. He was absolutely massive. King-size cigarettes had just come out, and I made some crack about him being a king-size singer. Yeah. So um, I think I gave him the name. So Ted Taylor became King Size Taylor and his band, The Dominoes. In Broad Green, Alan Caldwell changed his name to Rory Storm and his band became The Hurricanes. They were managed by Rory's mum, Vi. We got quite good money because she was ruthless about the money. She said, they're not playing for that, you know. It was like when George Harrison in the early years and... 1958 or 59, asked to join us, and she opened the door. And I can always remember this, because we were rehearsing, and I'd under the stairs or in the hall, and she said, I bought my guitar, I'd like to... I heard Rory's looking for a guitarist. And I said to him, look, son, you're too young. They're older than you. They're too old for you, son. And shut the door. And that was the end of it, like, you know... We could have had George Harrison in the band, you know. One fine day, um... Along came this fellow, uh, John Hutchinson, who lived around the corner. And uh, I didn't know at the time, but he was in a band called Casano Casanovas. And they were looking for a bass player. So he said to me, uh, can you play the bass guitar? I said, certainly. Having no idea at all, not ever having seen one. And for this first gig, I got two quid. And the wage then was only like two pounds, 10 shillings. And I thought, hmm, two quid for one hour? This is it. <laughs> Brian Jones was invited to join yet another new band, the Vegas Five. Jeff knocked on the door and uh, asked me if I sang. And I said, yes, I do. So he said, would you like to join a band as a singer? So I said, uh, well, I, I just bought this tenor saxophone yesterday. So he said, uh, we'll bring that along and, uh, you know, play that, which was ridiculous, really, because I only had it a day. So he came in and he brought the sax along. Well. He was pretty awful, <laughs> but he was a good singer, so we kept him on. I used to sing a third of the songs. There was three three singers in the band, so the when the other two singers were doing their their songs, I used to sort of honk in the background on one note, and then the next night I might get a bit more adventurous and sort of start honking on two notes. The band began advertising in the local paper to get gigs. We actually bought the paper that evening to see if our name was in it. And we saw this thing called The Undertakers, this band called The Undertakers. So uh, we didn't see our, our name, The Vegas Five Advertise. So we found up uh, the uh, agents and he said, oh no, there's been a misprint. If you look in the funeral column, The Vegas Five is in the funeral column and The Undertakers is in the actual gig that we were doing. So uh, just before we went on, we learnt the death march in the dressing room. straight into... Johnny Be Good, and that was that then was the advent of the Undertakers. We used to do a song called The Monster Mash, uh, and then the thing is, the crowd started getting used to me coming out of the coffin. So, what I used to do, I used to, I used to sneak round the back. And uh, they used to anticipate me coming out of the coffin, but I'd come from behind and I was dressed up as a monster. You go back to a gig you'd done, say, six months before, at one price, as the name of another man, and you're going as the Undertakers, doing marginally the same type of material. And you come, and they used to say, what do you have? you come? I said, yeah, but look at the show, you've had totally different show to what you got as the Vegas Five. I was still working in the butchers at that time, and uh, I, had, uh, I was able to get lots of props from the butchers, like, uh, like a tin of uh, a tin of sheep's eyes. And I used to throw these eyes at people, and the next thing is you'd see that these girls walking around with like three eyes. One like the eyes would be stuck in the middle of the forehead. I 
I used to sing numbers like I Remember You, and Jackie used to sing When I Fall In Love. So, you know, we were very sort of, um, I, was, I suppose you say commercial band in those days. In this vibrant scene, bands were constantly evolving. Cass and the Casanovas became the big three, one of the stalwarts of Merseybeat. Adrian had seen this uh, political headline in the paper. You know, I think it was probably Khrushchev and what, whoever they were, the big heads of state of those guys. Big three meeting in somewhere, New York or something. And he went, that's it, we're all quite tall, about six foot tall or something like that, and uh, that's it, the big three. Oh, they were great. You know, I mean, Johnny Hutch on drums, you know, he's a great character, and Griff on guitar. And Johnny Gus on, on bass. Oh, he's singing Little Richard numbers. I, I just stood there with my gobbo. Oh, bloody hell, that's great. He's going that. You know, it, it was. You were a very good band. Names were all important. Rory Storm, leader of the Hurricanes, forced his musicians, one of whom was a young Richard Starkey, to change their names. He was already Rory Storm, but we were the Hurricanes, so he said, you can't have names like John Byrne or Richard Starkey. The names have got to be changed. I'd seen the old Peggy Lee film, Johnny Guitar, so I said, that'll do me, I like the sound of that. Play it again, my Johnny. And Ringo used to wear the rings and that. We said, Ringo Starr. And he said, oh, if we call these names, said, this is Liverpool, it's a bit sissious and people will skit us, you know. I said, don't worry about that. Those names, so that was the names that we took and we, we stuck to them, you know. With the right names in place, Rory set about becoming a local legend. Hey, all you women, don't, don't come around. He'd get down to the girls on the front, sit on the front of the stage. He'd get a giant comb in the middle of a number, just stop. Comb his hair, you know. Make sure the sideboards are all right. Well, I can tell by the way that you look at me. We were in Birkenhead in a place called the Majestic Ballroom, and he'd go into the box and do a song, and then he'd stand on the edge of the box and try and jump from the box back onto the front of the stage. Now, you were talking, well, a good 20 foot. Now, he did it a few times, but one time he'd done it and he broke his leg, he had to be carted off. Another time he broke his arm. He wasn't afraid, he hadn't, he, how could I put it? He didn't have any nerves. Why no, you don't love me no more? While Rory was creating a reputation for himself, a young kid who worked on the railways was trying to come up with a name for his band. I was sitting home one day and I thought, hang on a minute. Mars from Marston and Bars of Music. We call ourselves Jerry Marston and the Mars Bars. Oh, yes, that is a good rock and roll day. My dad wrote to the Mars Bar Company. Said, can my son use your name? And they wrote back, no, how dare he? It's a trade name, he can't use the Mars Bar. So he changed it. I was watching television one afternoon and they had an athletics meeting up. The guy sent the pacemaker in this race, and I thought, oh, this name, the pacemakers. What a great name for a band. Hold on a shake going on. Another Mersey Beat staple, the Searchers, were in the process of forming. John and I were sort of the mainstay. We'd get together. We were the two guys who got together, either in his house or my house, and we'd um, we'd play lots of instrumental things. You know, I'd, I'd play the lead. John would back me up on the rhythm guitar. And I went to a pub called the. Cross Keys, it was pretty well attended. It was packed all the time, especially at weekends. And I was in there one Saturday night, and uh, there was a guy up on stage singing Elvis songs, and I thought, he's pretty good, you know, he's got the action. And this is Tony, Tony Jackson. Tony Jackson teamed up with the other two, initially as a guitarist. As I was the only one in a full-time job, I was designated to be the bass player, because I was the only one who could afford a bass guitar. For a drummer, they turned to Chris Curtis, who was to broaden their musical horizons. We couldn't get over the three of us, Tony, John and myself. The, the, the record collection that Chris Curtis had. He'd come up with all these songs. Yeah, it sounds great, let's rehearse that. And Chris used to stand up. He never sat down drumming, he stood up. And he was wild. She knows how to say that thing all right. One of 
the biggest stars of Mersey Beat was Billy J. Kramer. He started out as plain William Ashton and had never wanted to be a frontman. We had another singer, but then he decided that he didn't want to be in the rock and roll business and uh, he opened a hairdressing shop and left the band and then the band sort of pushed me into being the, the, the singer and uh, I had no experience whatsoever. I would have been quite happy to strum the guitar and stand behind somebody else. There was over 250 bands in Liverpool at that time, and uh, every one of those bands used to play in clubs in Liverpool on a Saturday night. Uh, I think there was more people in bands than what there was audiences. I don't think there was a band out of work on a Saturday night. And you used to do two or three gigs a night, you know, in those days. Like we'd do, the Craftsman's in Ellesmere Port, come back down and do the Auto Park Ballroom, and then do an all-nighter at the Iron Door. It's Saturday night now, just got paid, full of my money dough, trying to save. Ballrooms, clubs and town halls were all regular venues on the scene, but one place became inextricably linked with Mersey Beat. There was a club called The Cavern, which was in town, which was a jazz club. And we thought it'd be nice to get down and play there, you know, instead of just jazz, play some rock. So we went to a guy called Ray McFall, who was the boss. And one afternoon he said, OK, come and do an afternoon session for me over Wednesday. We did it. And it was such a success that the jazz club suddenly stopped playing jazz and played rock and roll. We've got a dance in Liverpool. The cats and chicks where they think it's cool. It started off with just a roll. Now they call it the cover stop. There's holes in the floor. <laughs> you have to watch where you were going. <laughs> You know, you'd leg would go down a hole somewhere, like you know, broken ankle as you were trying to dance, you know. It had that certain sort of atmosphere. And also, your clothes smelt of the cavern. My late mother always used to say, you've been to that cavern place, haven't you? Bob Willow was there. He was the compere. As he was around Liverpool on lots of venues. Um, he, he was the man, Bob Willow. He was the guy who kind of... The best of sellers, he used to call it, you know. And, uh, did a lot of other gigs too around the local dance halls and all that, you know. We had a great style. This is Bob Willis saying welcome to the Best of Cellar. We got the high by high and the lights down low, so here we go with the Big Three Show. In 1961, the local scene was in full swing. Then, more by accident than design, a whole new world opened up for Mersey Beat bands. But it was several hundred miles from Liverpool. All around the world, every boy and girl, is Pretty soon, all the Liverpool bands headed over to Hamburg, where they received more than a musical education. Everything was open four o'clock in the morning. There were strip shows, people wrestling in mud, cafes open. In Liverpool, everything gets shut at midnight. Horst Fascia, the manager of the Star Club, rough, in, in jail for killing the man. He was a boxer, and he killed the man in the ring, and they jailed him for it. Great guy. The way he used to speak, he said, tomorrow, he said, you go to the end of the Grosser Frahad, and you turn right, and there's a gun shop, and you buy some gas pistols. And I said, what do you want gas pistol for? He said, because you fucking need them in Hamburg. And then they gave us this badge with Star Club written on. He said, you keep that badge in your coat everywhere you go in Hamburg or you get killed. He said, but with that badge in, they know you work for Manfred and me and no one touches you. So he said to Kashmir, where's our hotel? He said, you don't have a hotel. This, this is where you live. I said, where? And it was two rooms at the side of the stage. And you'd get a rotor whereby you'd say, well, you know, you start at four o'clock in the afternoon and uh, you've got four groups going on after you and then you're on again at 12 o'clock midnight and then you're on again at two, uh, no, four o'clock in the morning. And, uh, you know, whoever's, whoever's got the last spot, like, you're walking home to your hotel at five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning. There used to be a lady that worked in the toilets and she, was like, she had like a little table, table uh, on the door of the toilets. And he used to go up and used to say, uh, have you got something for sore throat? And then she used to, like, give you these little Prelidin tablets. For one mark, you got three. Well, that stopped you eating. Great. <laughs> and that stopped you drinking. You didn't really want to drink, right? So it was cheap. 
And so but consequently, after one month playing at the Star Club, I came back two stone lighter and a nervous wreck. One band that found Hamburg audiences less than enthusiastic was the Swinging Blue Jeans, who at this stage were still playing trad jazz. Well, the DM was the first time he played, we gobsmacked, he just looked. You know, totally gobsmacked at this. What's that? I met my pretty bride down, down by the riverside, and we were really swinging, and the double bass was going, and Tommy was on the banjo, and it was really, really driving stuff that we played. Uh, and that they liked, but the German audience didn't understand it. We had to blend an electric bass, show them the technicalities of it, how to use the amp. Um, and we wrote a list of songs out for them. And to, to, the banjo player was virtually redundant. We were there for a month, and we couldn't go on playing trad jazz for a month. And he wouldn't give us our tickets to go home for a month. And so we changed to rock and roll. <laughs> Hamburg experience sharpened every band up and was to move the scene one step closer to national prominence. The big turning point, I think, for that scene was when the Beatles came back from Hamburg because they came back in all the black leather gear. They looked uh, to the girls, they had a great, a great amount of sex appeal. Just advertised as first appearance back from Hamburg. And then um, they had the leather jackets on. The place was packed, the heat was terrific. And they went down a bomb. The first time I saw the Beatles, I actually thought they were German, because a lot of people did. They were being billed as uh, straight from Hamburg, because they were over there so much, and they looked so different to anybody else. Um, all the different hairstyles and all dressing in leather. Um, but we thought, this is the place to go to. We need to go to Hamburg. And of course, there's no way we could have gone. We were just too young. There's a great photograph somewhere of me and Tony uh, at the Entry Institute. And Tony was still only 16. I was actually about a month, two months before my 15th birthday. And uh, we're trying to look, you know, dead cool and everything with Coca-Colas with straws in. We found that we're both of us like the Everly Brothers. And when we tried singing together, we found out we could sound just like the Everly Brothers. So we think, well, this is a good basis for a band. So we called ourselves the Mavericks. And uh, Bob Wallace saw us and said, I think you're absolutely wonderful, but you need to be launched and you need a new name. So we went down to, to town, me and Tony, and, uh, OK, what's the name of it? What are we, we going to be called? He said, The Mersey Beats. You came to me one summer night. The Mersey Beats were the latest addition to a growing list of bands. In this competitive environment, poaching of good musicians by other bands was endemic, as Rory Storm was about to find out. Say so the Beatles would stand at the side of the stage, Ringo was still playing with us, he was still our drummer, and they'd watch the shows, cos he was just so good, you know. He could put anything over. I can tell, pretty baby, it's so plain to... It was at a holiday camp residency that Ringo Starr got a call. We went up to the reception and uh, Ringo picked the phone up. And he goes, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, great, yeah, yeah, OK, yeah. And he said, oh, does it have to? Have to come off, you know. But they, they would tell him to shave the beard off. <laughs> and he didn't want to, you know. So they didn't have to, oh, you know, no one above that, you know. Next thing he put the phone down and he said, uh, sorry, Bob, I won't be joining the demo. I'm going to join the Beatles. So I said, you've cracked it, son. Because you know? he knew they were going to be so huge, you know. Instrumental in the Beatles' success was a young record shop owner, Brian Epstein, who became their manager. He set about signing as many of the other bands as he could. Brian Epstein took them over, then he started casting his net a bit wider, Jerry and, and Scylla. And he took us over and uh, immediately there was no smoking on stage, no eating, no eating sandwiches, no beer, you know, on the piano and all of that. And uh, you've got to dress more smartly, boys. So I said, yes, Brian, we'll sign up for you. And all that meant to me was giving him the diary, not thinking really of fame. So right, Brian, fill that, get us a few more quid. And if anything happens, we're laughing. Brian said, Billy Kramer has a group called The Coasters and they don't want to turn pro. By this time, we were a professional band. Uh, he said, would you consider backing him? You know, because John Lennon has suggested that, you know, we approach you. 
So, to um, be quite honest with you, none of us were really up to bat Bill because we thought, oh, no, he takes Billy Fury off. You know, we want to be on our own, Brian. Now he said, no, the deal is for you to bat Billy. I don't think they were really into it. And, and they sort of, you know, he said, you can make your own records and, and back Billy on his records. So the Dakotas backed Billy J. Kramer, an alliance that was to lead to success. When it came to recording, Epstein began suggesting songs for all of his acts, often trying them out on the Beatles first. And Ryan rang me up. He said, Jerry, I think I've got a song for you. I said, oh, great. Smash him on, is it? He said, it's a thing called How Do You Do It? He said, the Beatles have just recorded it, but they don't want to do it. John said, no, nah, it's rubbish. So John says, Brian Epstein, give it to Jerry, he'll do it. So Brian rang me. He sent me the Associates of the Beatles. I thought, yeah, that's a good song. Anything to get on a record. Brian rung me on the Tuesday, because we knew on the Tuesday Charles came out on Friday. Brian rung me and said, uh, Jerry, he said, uh, how'd you do it to get to number one? I said, oh, bloody hell. Thanks, Brian. Put the phone down. My mum was in the back kitchen. I said, ma'am. I said, well, I said, how'd you do it to get to number one? She said, what does that mean? I said, I think it means uh, we're nearly famous. Epstein used the songwriting talents of Lennon and McCartney to power the Mersey Beat scene. Brian gave us the, like, do you want to know a secret? And uh, it was just John Lennon singing, uh, do you want to know a secret on, on an acoustic guitar? And uh, at the end, he sort of apologized for the quality of the song and flushed the toilet. Billy bowed to pressure from Epstein and do you want to know a secret became a hit. Listen, do you want to know a secret? Do you promise not to tell? Whoa, whoa, whoa. For his biggest hit, Billy revolted against Epstein and refused to record another Lennon and McCartney song, preferring his own choice, Little Children. It was a song that I'd found myself. I believed in the song. Brian Epstein was totally against me recording Little Children and even went as far as to say that I'd insulted the two finest songwriters in the world. I'm telling you, little children, you better tell what you see. Little Children, uh, I think, really was um, the best record we ever did. And it sounds terrible when you've got John Lennon and Paul McCartney writing your first four records. But a lot of problems with that because Brian didn't want us to do it. So I remember in the studio there was a lot of rounds. Like around. I wonder what can I do around little children like you. The swinging blue jeans returned from Hamburg and now a proper rock and roll band got a deal with HMV and were given to staff producer Wally Ridley. Wally Ridley was more uh, a Ronnie Hilton type of um recording manager he was very much middle of the road roger whittaker and that type of music mr wally ridley the recording manager controls the balance of the music so that the players will get the sound they really want For goodness sake, I got the hippie, hippie shake. when we came down with the hippie, hippie shake he didn't rate that very much at all I got the hippie, hippie shake. He was saying he couldn't hear the words clearly, and Norman was saying, well, to hell with the words. If people want to listen to the beat and they want the driving rock rhythm, the words are unimportant. And Wally Ridley was saying, well, he's been recording for years and it's the other way round. For goodness sake, I got the hippie, hippie shakes. Yeah. When we did the first LP, we didn't have enough material. Uh, I can remember in the morning uh, and before we broke for lunch, um, we said, well, that's all we've got. And Wally said, well, you can't have because the studio's booked for the day and it's very expensive. We said, well, you know, we'll have to come back. He said, well, you can't do that. You've got to use the time up. 
So we said, well, OK, you go off and have your lunch and we'll work some numbers out. Sweets for my sweet, sugar for my... Next, it was the searcher's turn to record, this time with Tony Hatch. But I can remember going into the studios and we rehearsed the song, and I think we did it in three takes, all standing around one microphone. Um, and I thought it wasn't perfect. But, of course, Tony, Tony Hatch, he's up in the box and he's saying, that's it, boys, we've got, a, we've got one, we've got a master. You know, we're saying, we can do a better one. No, no, that's it. That's good enough. Again, it was a hit. Right down through the history of rock and roll, if you find a band that has a success with one record, you'll always find that the follow-up is very, very similar. So anyway, Tony said, I've got this song, uh, a friend of mine has written it for you, blah, 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 great. And we did it, Children's and Spice, sure enough, back up to the top of the charts. We actually found out later that Tony Hatch had written the song himself. <laughs> With this newfound success, the Searchers flamboyant drummer, Chris Curtis, began to see himself as group leader. Chris was the showman out of the band. And because of that, although we were all equal guys and we all loved the same music and all that, Chris then began to get a bit, well, it's my band, you know, so I tell everyone what to do. And I think that's what it started the friction was. I walked in the studio, all set up, and he just walked up to me and said, uh, I don't want you to sing on this album, Tony. Your voice isn't good enough. Which, you know, I fell through the floor. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, that's the polite version of what do you mean. He said, no, he said, no, Michael's going to do it. Mike's going to sing, take all the leads. You're just playing bass. I said, well, look, I've been lead singer on two albums, two number ones. And then he says, I don't like the way you're playing bass. I want you to do it this way. So I blew my top, you know, and I said, Chris, I said, what the F and L are you on about? I said, you're the drummer in the band. I said, you don't lead it. I said, why don't you need 60 drums? Tony lost out in the battle with Chris and was kicked out of the band. Your dreams of fame have all come true. Now I'm just a no one next to you. I was expecting, stupidly, like that, when the news broke that I was out of the band, I'd have a flood of phone calls like from Holly's or anyone who thought I could do a job for them. Will he join us, you know, foremost or Mersey Beach or somebody? But nothing came. I wished him well, you know, I wished he would have made a big name. Uh, I mean, I didn't really want him to leave the band. But you get caught up in so many emotions in, the, in those circumstances. Tony formed a band called The Vibrations, but even then couldn't escape his past in the searches. My agent said, no one's going to book you with that name. They've got to know it's you. You've got to use your name up front. I say, yeah, but I don't want to be. He said, well, you won't get any bookings if you don't. So it ended up as Tony Jackson and the Vibrations. But it was just going to be the Vibrations. But just to get the bookings and so people could say, oh, yeah, Tony Jackson searches, you know, X or whatever. We'll go and see him. While Tony struggled with a solo career, the Mersey Beats were taking off. Record companies were chasing. <laughs> won a recording contract with Decca Records. At the same time, Fontana Records had been up to Liverpool to see us working at the cavern. So we literally had two recording contracts and we didn't know which one to sign. So we went back then to Bob Waller, Master's Advice, and he says, well, a brand new label, and you're one of the first acts that they've signed up, they're gonna spend more time and more money on you than if you sign up with Decca. They've got countless number of acts, I think, since they lost the Beatles, I think they signed almost everybody. It's love that really counts Believe me, it's love that really counts And maybe... The Mersey Beats, with two hits under their belts, were on the verge of greater things when they suffered a serious blow. We started getting offers to go to Italy, to America, to Germany, to all these places. And um, 
Billy suddenly got very disillusioned with the whole thing, wanted to leave to open the hairdressing shop, and that was it. Walk on through the wind. For his third single, Jerry Marsden, against the wishes of Brian Epstein, decided to record a Rogers and Hammerstein number. He put it down, then George put the violins on and everything. And when I heard it, a week later, I went into listening to the tracks. And I went, ah! Oh. I said, oh, George, that's lovely. Straight, I said, wonderful. He said, thank you. So Brian was there. And I said, that's the third record. Brian nearly had a heart attack. And we put it out. <laughs> and it was the fastest one to go to number one. And you live. Walk Along became something bigger than I'd ever anticipated. Because at Anfield, they would play the top ten records from the charts. So when Walk Along was number one, the last, the last record they played was the number one, just before the kick-off. And the DJ would play them, and he would get to Walk Alone, just before the kick-off. And the cop, which held in those days like 25,000 people, started singing it. And you live. In Hamburg, King Size Taylor and the Dominoes would record numerous albums under different names. One was an album for Scottish singer Alex Harvey. Alex come roaring around one morning. It's like about 10 o'clock in the morning. We'd be in a bed about half an hour. I've got to do an LP today. Now, do you like that? <laughs> I've got to do an LP today. Because it's supposed to be a live album. <laughs> See, so at the end of at the end of every uh, song that we did, as soon as we come to the end, we all went, hey! <laughs> we'll put our own applause on, see? And then done it again. <laughs> he played the track back to us, and we put our own applause on again, and we're all whistling and banging bottles, and it came out, it sounded so live, it was wonderful. And it came out, it was uh, Alex Harvey and his soul band, live at the top ten Hamburg, when in actual fact it was Alex Harvey and the Dominoes <laughs> out the reds in Polydor Studios. <laughs> In Liverpool, the Big Three were offered a recording opportunity, but the wrong choice of material scuppered their chances. We were allowed to do an R&B tune for our first single, which was some kind of sop in the right direction, yeah? But from then on, it went downhill rapidly. Uh, songwriters were brought in, uh, Mitch Murray, and uh, By The Way was brought up, this song By The Way, which the Beatles had turned down as being you know, awful. I can tell that you're the one By the way you keep me thinking of you Oh, by the way, I love you And some bright spark had finally realised that uh, these tunes they're recording is not what this band is about. So they thought, we'll, we'll make an album, a proper 12-inch you know, album of Live at the Cavern, which we did. We recorded two whole sets, one after the other, allowing for mistakes in the control room, you know, with the tapes and etc. One more time, boys, and all this. Uh, nobody paid to get in, it was packed, all screaming their brains out, they all knew it was anyway. Bob Waller was there with his, uh, his medicinal uh, potions. <laughs> and 